Hello, welcome to Hellshire's Haven. So I have before me an IBM Correcting Selectric 3, the same one that was featured in this lovely video. So this was the eighth typewriter in my collection of currently around like 120 machines. Um, so this was obtained back in maybe either, uh, yeah, probably either January or February of 2021, having started collecting in December of the preceding year. So yeah, now it's been like two years and five months, so like ever since I recently, so the reason that I haven't been posting very often is because I've been getting into headphones, as you can see here. Um, so yeah, <laughs> got one of these, absolutely beautiful. Um, I'll probably soon be posting, albeit rather long videos about these headphones and my impressions and what I've personally found with high-end stuff. Um, anyways, so yeah, audiophile, audiophilia, it's been occupying me a lot and now working on saving up for at least probably one last super high-end Summit Fi headphone, if it meets my standards. Anyways, so... Yeah, I got this for around 90 US dollars on eBay. Uh, had it shipped from Longmount, Colorado. Um, yeah, it was ready in pretty nice and reasonably clean shape. Technically, this thing here was broken. Um, so, yeah, the keys, most of the keys were a bit gummy as tends to happen when you have a old Selectric sitting around unused for a long time. Um, so I basically just left it on hold for a few months until I finally tried surfacing it myself. I got a bit somewhere at least with cleaning up these pivots and whatnot, um, but mainly came at an impasse when the, I believe it's the tension, clutch tension spring, Forget the, forget the terms. Um, I found that it was overstretched, probably due to its having been powered on while the mechanisms were seized. Uh, so, yeah, I needed a replacement for that spring, but let's say that I wasn't so keen on spending upwards of $30, including shipping, to get one, and the local typewriter shops, unfortunately, course would not sell you individual pieces so I decided that I just might as well go ahead and uh, send this guy in for a proper service and cleaning um, yeah beforehand I had always repaired or fixed and cleaned my own typewriters but yeah this time it's nice to have it professionally done in that case I had it done by Dominion business machines quite nice personnel um, took about a month due to the backlog uh, so, yeah, that was finally all nice and working, except for somehow the tabulator, the tab set mechanism, wasn't really working properly still. So yeah, that's power spacer. So normally, if you press this, you should be able to hit the tab, but it's not doing it, or it's not even setting the tab at all. Not sure if it has anything to do with by being on 12 CPI instead of 10 CPI. Let's say that I set tab here. It's probably not gonna work. Okay, there you go, but the other tab didn't work. Um, so, yeah, lovely machine. Originally, I thought that the touch was rather similar to my model FAT over here. Um, but I guess the main difference is technically the touch is lighter, but then you also have the tactility from actually pressing the keys. Or basically, um, let's just say that, yeah, I'm not going to go too in-depth into this particular machine, uh, since there are plenty of videos, especially like this one by Kairos, um, on how this works, but yeah, basically there's an interposer and just a bunch of things that happen. That causes the tactility to be rather special and technically allows you to do a really nice and quick tap, as you'll see, in order to actuate the mechanism. 
Anyways, so the main thing that I'm sharing with this video is the fact that I am currently preparing for tomorrow's 2023 Spring Canada Mechanical Keyboard Meetup held in Toronto. So, of course, even though I do have some pretty cool keyboards such as the Univac 1710 Teletype or Key Punch keyboard, um, let's say that, of course, for this first year, I would like to bring typewriters. Um, so I'll probably have a photo of what I did bring. But otherwise, the goal here is that I want to be able to type out a whole bunch of little mini business cards. So, yeah, this page took about like 30 to 40 minutes. Um, maybe most 30 minutes with practice. And I did make a, quite a few mistakes. Um, and I'm going to show you how I got at these margins. <laughs> so, let's get another... Even tell you to wait. 65 pound for stock. I did start off with a little test run. So this would be the final layout for each side. So basically I have my margin all the way to the left. And I've set this guy accordingly. I'm not going to move it right now. This one. He's a bit stubborn. Okay. So, basically, you'll see here. This is where one struggles a bit. So let's say that I'm now at number. Wait, first let's double check that it's actually lined. Yeah, that's lined. So number 96, and I want to type out number 97. Now you'll notice that if I keep on typing, this guy will get creased over, which is actually what happened in this corner here. Um, but of course, to me, I'm going to pretend that all the mistakes and other tidbits are collectible for these little tickets. Tickets about the size of a fortune cookie fortune anyways so I'm basically just holding up this little guy to allow me to type oops actually hit the thing oh <laughs> okay and I'm in the wrong pitch darn it so you can see there, it's still 10 CPI. So here we have a lovely correcting mechanism. Oops. Uh, okay. So 
I had to set it back to 12 CPI. Seven. So yeah, at this point then I can type faster. And I've technically, by chance, ended up on this perfect length of phrase to perfectly fill the line on a number Oh, yeah, for some reason, the, some of the keys are sticky still. And eight. express return since I don't want this guy to get ripped or pieced. So I'll do that first, then we can do our character turn. And so on. Okay, so this is about as fast as I'll be working. mechanism at least isn't working properly. So I have to put it up with the power spacer. later. Oops. Uh, yeah, that's six. mistake so now you're going to see the correction process basically I have to press this guy that primes a mechanism oopsies, to literally lift the character off of the page so looking closer You'll see the character is disappearing. So this guy here is the correction tape. So now
allowed them off by one error for entire line. And I want to fix it. Okay, so for this last row, you'll see that I'll need to hold this guy down while typing so as to preserve the alignment. So, 19. Well, that was a debacle. Then we have this bit to do. So, I want that. And I have to remember the number of spaces. The alignment is unfortunately off as you can see, but it's at least within a reasonable margin of error. <laughs> I need to cut these up. Alignment is still a bit off, but it's not that bad. Okay, so time to cut it up. I have for myself this recollections thing from Michael's. That's his high school. So first, let's do a little trim. Okay, so I do have to include a bit of space below. Here I'm using a fresh blade for my X-Acto. That's decent. Not too bad. There we 
go. That's our first bit here, kind of cut into the tops of the next row though. So you're not perfect, but it's decent. Easter Bunny typos. I suppose here it's just easier for me to freehand it. So I'm just stacking them in order and putting them upside down into a sub stack over here. Yes, I'm going to be delivering this. Or I can freehand multiple at once, uh, but this time I could stack them, but I don't know, I'm not that confident in maintaining the alignment by that means. No, it doesn't have to be that perfect. Okay, I'm finally done, so First page, second page, these are grouped in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, stacks of 15, this one has 18, I think here I might have messed up and only put 12, such that this one has uh, 21. Anyways, I'm going to have to put these all together and figure out how much depth I need for my holder. Okay, so I've measured the width of this to be approximately 75 millimeters. So I'll have 75 and then a centimeter on either side in terms of height. Um, so now I'm going to put this into this electric and type out my stuff so that I can determine what height I need. Okay, so I've drawn out my net. Um, I'm planning on making the clasp using just like some separate piece that I will attach with some glue. Okay, so that regard. Now I intend on making the flaps here, so these ones will fold this way and in. So something like this. So, and so on. Or something like this. And then I'll glue these bits with this guy. I used to do a lot of basic paper craft back in high school, designing my own 3D nets. I mean, typically, you know, just with a pencil, nothing too fancy. Of course, I'd seen all the fancier paper craft you can see online. I did download the occasional nets and try making some models. 
Now, funny thing is, I remember in grade one, I had, a, we had an assignment where we were learning about 3D shapes and prisms. So, yeah, I learned about, about the net of a rectangular prism. And I remember, particularly, I used brown coloring pencil, then it got taped to a display wall out in the hallway. Um, then, one day, we had an assignment where we had to make the, these like paper flower bouquets, and everyone else was doing them in 2D, making 2D vase. You know what I did? <laughs> um, even though I was an idiot in every other regard, I made myself a lovely 3D basket for my paper flowers. <laughs> so, yeah, I remember the principal came in on the class and was impressed. Yeah, the principal was chill, everyone else, all the other teachers weren't. <laughs> so I decided to cut out these little pieces here to reinforce the corners. I had also in high school made convenient use of paper craft for some of my projects. Sometimes for the amusement of my group members. Sometimes it will experience noise that causes it to spin in different directions. So currently it doesn't really sense much of anything. So this here is going to be for a simple front latch. So let's just fold this, make sure there's enough clearance for the actual latch to fit through. So it'll fold like that. And then you want to do an opposite fold on this side. by a bit less than a millimeter, maybe. Like that. Then I'll glue that on to the front. Okay, so our little box is effectively done. And time to load it with slips. If I can get a hold of this. Yes. Okay. 
and if only I could somehow carefully coax like a bit of a slant. There you go. Perfect. Kind of. Okay. Problems to the last, the very last ones, but um, I guess that is a bit of a design oversight. It is. Okay. So that's what that looks like. And then for actually closing it, simply slide this through. And fold it up. Okay, there we are. It's not the most secure. Maybe ideally I would have had some like additional side bits here, but it was kind of too late because I already cut into it. So that's it. Now I haven't actually tested the user friendliness, but let's see. So, yeah, not bad. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> so I've cut out this little insert that I'm going to glue in. That's much better. So, pressing a bit. Yeah, pressing this way will push it toward the back. Otherwise, if you press here, push it toward the front. The important bit is that the back here isn't flipping. So, that's good. It should be a lot more secure. <laughs> 